I'm pleased to be joined by Christopher Meyer, the Vice President of External Affairs at Consumers Union, the publisher of Consumer Reports. Welcome to Citywide. Thanks. So we've been talking about policy shops this year on, uh, on the show, uh, organizations that help frame the issues that uh, drive public policy. Consumers Union is, is best known for uh, its research uh, on products and of, of different kinds, but you also are an organization with a point of view. So tell us about the policy side of, uh, of, of where you work. Uh, Consumers Union is more than seven decades old. We're primarily known for publishing consumer reports, but in the early editions of the magazine, 1939, we came out in favor of single payer uh, universal health insurance. So we've had a point of view on health care and on other issues for as long as we've been around. Although, frankly, most people don't associate us with the point of view. They associate us with telling them what's the best appliance or best car to buy. So what are some of the issues that you're working on now? Uh, for now, it is health care, health care, health care. Uh, our president, Jim Guest, uh, when he took uh, the presidency several years ago, identified health care as an issue that wasn't only important to our subscribers, but to the public at large. And so what we're looking to do on a federal level is get involved in the debate this year by talking to our subscribers and the public and amassing stories of different issues that the public has with the health care system, whether it's a, a billing issue, whether it's a portability issue, and gathering stories. Right now we have more than 2,000 um, that are part of our website. We're going out on the road this summer to interview the best of these stories to then put back on our website. Um, the RV tour, which will cover the 48 states between Memorial Day and Labor Day, will also be designed to um, shore our partnerships with groups, all to get ready for the 2009-2010 congressional session. That's on the federal side. On the state side, we've also been involved in getting legislation passed on a narrow but very important issue, and that's on how much hospitals should be disclosing about hospital-acquired infections. Turns out that almost 100,000 Americans die each year from hospital-acquired infections, and until four years ago, not a single state had regulated in this area. What, what do you mean, people who get sick when they go to the hospital? Yeah, they go in for what they consider routine surgery and either don't leave because they contract and die in the hospital, or they are really ill. Uh, this happens all the time. For example, Grant Hill, one of my favorite NBA stars, contracted this infection when he went in for routine surgery several years ago. It happens more than you think. But hospitals, because they don't do very basic things like require uh, medical professionals to wash their hands or wash sur surgical instruments, are causing harm. They don't need to. And so we now have gotten 22 states to pass laws in this area, including New York. But is disclosure the, the, the answer? Uh, there's a lot of information out there that's available about um, success rates with cardiac surgery, other things with hospitals, but I think the typical person when they get sick either goes to the place that the ambulance takes them or goes to the place where their doctors send them. You put your finger on where we want to go in healthcare, which is to, in time, provide the same kind of ratings for different health services that we have in the electronics, auto, or appliance field. Some do it. We think we can do it well with a combination of skilled medical professionals that we're beginning to hire uh, to use our methodological instruments, our survey. Right now, we get a million of our subscribers every year to fill out a survey that is very, very complicated and long, but provides a treasure trove of information. We're going to focus more and more on health care. So eventually, we're going to be rating hospitals. And do you think doctors. that'll actually change the behaviors of the institutions? It already has. I mean, one of the things that um, I've done in my whole public interest career and now a consumer's union no different is for third parties like us to change the marketplace by identifying issues, doing research, getting states to pass laws, and then having the industry, in this case hospitals, take what we've done in government with government, which is admittedly not as laser focused as maybe it could be because we don't know the industry as well as they do, then they take what the state has done and they make it better. That's what we're starting to see in hospitals across the country on our one issue, but we're hoping that it becomes a larger issue because it's not just about infections, it's about the issue of medical errors that will likely be one of the key issues that will be uh, facing the next president in Congress. How do you impact on, on, on policy? You've talked about some of the techniques, but as an organization, you don't endorse candidates, you don't make political contributions, uh, you don't uh, drive voters to the polls. So why should an elected official pay attention to you? 
traditional lobbying expertise, which we've had for decades and that we continue to have both in Washington and in some of the states. But that alone, as you say, given our limited resources, would mean that we would be one of those groups that maybe you pat on the head, respect a particular lobbyist, and then move on. What we're now trying to do is harness the power of our subscriber base and interested consumers. We now have more than 600,000 what we call e-activists, electronic activists who routinely send letters or make phone calls to members of Congress That's or the state legislature. Right? Well, it depends who you're comparing yourself to. We're not moveon.org, which has millions, but for a consumer group, it's significant. It rivals what other groups that you would think of as our peers, whether it's AARP or other groups have. But even more important than the 650,000 e-activists are what we call our super activists. These are individuals who've made an especial commitment to doing more than just hitting a keystroke once in a while. These are activists who either share their stories, I mentioned, on health care, or who are now willing to go to Washington to lobby. Most recently, there is product safety legislation that uh, both the House and Senate have passed that would uh, strengthen the Consumer Product Safety Commission, try to get rid of lead that's coming from China in the toys that our kids are purchasing. Um, we have our lobbying expertise, and that was really helpful in this case, but what was even more helpful was when Senator Pryor from Arkansas, the Senate sponsor, wanted families, wanted victims. We actually, because of our network, were able to fly in five families from different parts of the country to a Washington news conference, and that made all the difference. Same thing happened on FDA reform last year, where we put a human face on what could be seen as a dry issue, which is reforming the FDA when in fact you have a woman who lost her husband because of a misdiagnosis of a drug, that's a very, very powerful thing. Where does your money come from? Tell us a little bit about the organizational structure. We are, we are very lucky to have a very loyal and big subscriber base. Our budget uh, next year will be close to a quarter billion dollars a year. 90% of it comes from subscriptions. We have more than 4 million uh, print subscribers. They buy the magazine. And the biggest secret is we now have 3 million online subscribers. There's some overlap between the two, but between those two products and our newsletters in the financial services area and health, we have more than 8 million subscribers. When Consumer Reports rates a product, typically you're looking at safety, and you're looking at value for your dollar. To what extent do you take into account other values, such as whether the workers who produce the goods are paid a prevailing wage, or whether the factory where the product is made uh, you know, is polluting a local uh, river? Is it just about value to the consumer, um, or are there other things that maybe transcend those issues? That's a great question. It's changed over time. There was a time when we, because we're a consumer's union, and we actually are part of the Newspaper Guild, and a lot of our members are, are unionized, um, we did look at worker rights. And that is something that is still a part of our overall uh, uh, look at a product. But um, more and more now, we're looking at green. We're trying to see what the value is of green. And occasionally, we step in hot water with our friends in the environmental community, because when we looked closely at hybrid cars, for example, we showed that the rate of return may not be as quick as many consumers would like. We didn't say you shouldn't buy it for other really important social reasons or environmental reasons. Rate of return meaning savings in gas didn't necessarily pay for the premium exactly. on the cost of the car exactly. itself. It, it took more time than many consumers might, but that's our job. I mean, our, We view our job as we call it as we see it. We do make a strong case in another part of the website for a site we have called Greener Choices, where we talk about if you want to buy, here's the best value within green. Because as you know, um, many organizations want to label their food as organic right. or as you know, free of hormones. That may not be. So we view ourselves as the truth tellers. There's a recent campaign that you've done, also automobile related, that um, is a uh, sort of truth-telling operation, I guess, so, although I'm, I guess the, also that the people on the receiving end of the uh, effort might not agree with your uh, analysis. So I'm buying a car, and the uh, dealer says to me, you know, it's a great car, dealer's going to cover it, but at some point um, it's going to run out of that uh, warranty protection, and for a modest amount of money, I can extend that warranty. What do you think? Good idea? Uh, bad idea. 
bad, bad idea, and not just for cars. Um, we took out a full-page ad in USA Today in March, which is unusual for us. We are you know, not an organization that every month takes out full-page ads. We just don't have the budget for it. But we've now done it four times in the last 18 months, twice on extended warranties. The one that you're referring to in March was a big part of our annual April car issue where we warn consumers that an extended warranty on a car is a bad idea. That's not just based on our own uh, research. We actually interviewed and got, as I mentioned before, a survey, 8,000 of our subscribers to report in how much they spent on a warranty and how much they got in return. And on average, our consumers spent $1,000 on a warranty and they got back $700 in value. But isn't that the, just like any kind of insurance policy? You, you, you buy it and then you hope you never need it? Um, this is one of those cases where um, the buying of it is not worth the small amount back. This is not like insurance. Um, and I've, to extend it out to other products, whether it's uh, computers or other appliances, often by the time you want to use it, the repair is not even worth the cost of the new piece. So it's, it's certainly a way for the companies to build their profit margin without it being seen as good for the consumer. When you ran that ad, it was newsworthy. It got written up in the New York Times and I assume other newspapers uh, around the, uh, the country. Is publicity sort of a, a force multiplier uh, for your advocacy? For public interest organizations, and we view ourselves as a nonprofit, but as a public interest group, our ability to drive what we call free media, even if we use earned media, a paid ad, to do so is critical because although the megaphone of our products is large, getting an article in the New York Times makes it even larger and resonates even more. So yes, we try to use our resources to magnify our points of view and it works. We did another full page ad on uh, gift cards, on the fact that $8 billion a year in those gift cards that all of us love to get and receive go unused. It's a win-win-win for the companies. Just exposing that and having the dialogue with those companies I think will change how gift cards are used. Just doing the ad wouldn't be enough. Getting the huge amount of free media that we got around the holiday season started a conversation that I think educated consumers. Citywide will continue right after this. I see skies of blue and clouds of white, the bright blessed days, the dark sacred night, and I think to myself, what a wonderful world. If you're not recycling, you're throwing it all away. <laughs> Welcome back to Citywide. We're speaking with Christopher Meyer, Vice President at Consumers Union. One of the things that uh, Consumer Reports is known for, uh, rating products, giving people um, uh, sort of technical information about them, but then also, as, as we were discussing in the first half of the show, surveying large uh, groups of people about their experience. The Internet now provides at least some of that information in the sense that you can go to any number of websites and hear or read uh, people's opinions about uh, vacation spots, uh, pens, cars, uh, suits, uh, you name it. How do you think that's changing consumer behavior? Do you think that, that, it's, uh, that's, it, that it has an impact on the development of products and how companies uh, uh, conduct themselves? It's a really important question. It used to be that consumers listened to consumer reports as the only oracle on information. It's not true anymore. They now listen to us, hopefully. They listen to government. They listen to industry. But they listen to each other. And if we at Consumer Reports don't provide a space for our subscribers to engage us and each other, we will fall behind our competitors, whether it's on the autos online segment or other areas. So, um, and that's difficult for us because for us to share our space with subscribers who sometimes are much smarter than we are, but whose research is untested and provide that space threatens our credibility. But we have to move with the times. And blogging is another example where uh, until a year ago, even our very sophisticated communications team 
didn't really have a blog strategy and we were threatening to fall behind other competitors. We now have hired a very good firm, uh, Attention PR, to work with us on uh, trying to get into the top 50 or 100 or 200 blog areas, uh, blog sites, and it's made a huge difference. Just give you one example. One of our product safety team noticed that in Hannah Montana's most recent movie, she was not wearing a seatbelt. So we just wrote about it, did not expect any play. It got picked up by some of the blogs, and it became our number one traffic driver to our website for days. And all the comments were not positive. I mean, half of the people thought we were being nannies. You know, who are you to be policing? That's up to parents. And the other half saying, yeah, she should be wearing a seatbelt. We were very gratified when Hannah Montana, Miley Cyrus herself, apologized for not wearing the seatbelt. Uh, and so what came out of it was a very healthy, good discussion about car safety. And, and engaging a lot of people. Engaging in people and the demographic that, frankly, we don't always uh, represent. The average subscriber to the print magazine is around 60 years old. The average subscriber online is about a decade younger. Um, but a decade younger still leaves out a huge part of the population that we hope one day will read our publications, but right now isn't. The Hannah Montana piece, blogging, the full page ads, are a whole new network. The, the, the flip side, though, um, to the Internet is the vast amount of wrong information that, that's out there. If you, um, you've you come home from the hospital with an infection and now you want to find out what to do about it, uh, so you type in your symptoms and you may get driven to a uh, the Mayo Clinic's uh, website, uh, but you could also be driven to some quacks website. How do you... How do you know what to rely on in the internet when the amount of information is just so vast? It's, uh, it's a really good question and it's not easy. We have a project that was developed uh, without this particular idea in mind called WebWatch, which is a watchdog on the veracity of sites in different areas. We are going to uh, attempt to take the credibility we've built in assessing different websites. We've actually uh, all asked all of the top websites with the most traffic to sign kind of a bill of rights to make sure that what they're um, writing is accurate and train that on health ratings because there's nothing more important when you're in distress and you type in to make sure that WebMD or other sites are giving you uh, good information. We want to provide uh, to be the traffic cops to let you know the sites that are legitimate and the ones that are not providing good information. So it's a critical need that we hope to fill. You've talked about some of the work that the organization is involved with um, uh, health care, for example, as an issue, but the notion of consumer rights, the consumer movement, going back to uh, Ralph Nader and some of the early uh, auto safety things, has it run out of steam? Is, is, is it still, do, do people still uh, feel uh, that it's important uh, to put consumer interests um, uh, at the top of their political agenda or have the successes that uh, have been accomplished in terms of uh, uh, regulations, uh, OSHA, product safety, and the like, um, sort of solve the problem. Products are safer than they were when Ralph Nader started in the 60s. There are now a network of public interest uh, activists, consumer activists, that have taken the mantle of what Nader did in the 60s and 70s and built careers out of it, so that's all good. But it's fair to say that in the last quarter century, the public mood toward greater government regulation is, I would say, mixed. Our, many of our elected leaders seem to be allergic to strong enforcement of consumer laws, and there have not been champions at the federal level, uh, with some wonderful exceptions in both parties, to be champions. That may be changing. And I'll give you the two examples we cited earlier, whether it's reform of the FDA, where it's clear that the leading government watchdog over uh, health and safety and drugs in this country is woefully underfunded, um, what got to such a crisis proportion with what happened with Vioxx uh, and other companies that government, Congress put a lot more money into it. More recently with lead and toys, it took us and other consumer groups to tell the public that we had only one inspector of toys in the whole CPSC, Consumer Product Safety Commission, uh, apparatus to make sure that we were making sure, making sure that our uh, kids had safe toys. We don't have enough money in ports to make sure that uh, steamers coming in with toys and other products are safe. So I believe that now 
the public is much more interested in making sure that products are safe, particularly as we import more and more from countries whose laws are not as stringent as ours. But what about the, 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 the argument, not necessarily directed at, at Consumers Union, but at other organizations that um, a lot of the activism is driven by trial lawyers, that they are big funders of uh, some public interest organizations, and that what they're really interested in doing is creating new legal theories that allow them to sue, and that we're burdening industry with all of these uh, uh, litigations. Is the, one, do you think the allegation has any, uh, any substance to it? And secondly, uh, um, whether it does or not, is litigation the right way to be making policy? Uh, you've asked three good questions. Um, do I think that sometimes there are trial lawyers who take advantage of the system for their own gain? Absolutely. And even I, who's a strong defender of the right to uh, seek compensation when you've been hurt, has to acknowledge the recent cases where very well-known trial attorneys across the country uh, were found guilty of pretty serious charges of tampering or uh, blackmail. That There's no place for that. Having said that, I fear that the... Uh, those stories then drive an entire industry-led agenda to limit the ability of people who have been harmed to seek compensation in the courts. And I would say the Supreme Court over the last couple of decades has increasingly narrowed the rights of consumers to file lawsuits. Um, and I think that's I think that's harmful. I think consumers need an expanded uh, portfolio uh, to be able to get their uh, rights heard, especially when in Congress and in the states, industry uh, is playing an even larger role in shaping the debate. People feel overwhelmed. Um, globalization means that uh, you know rising consumer demands in China has an impact on the price of concrete in, here in New York. Uh, they feel that decisions are being made by uh, elected officials, uh, by the media, uh, financial institutions, that they don't have much control over their, uh, their lives. So if you were to talk to the average New Yorker who uh, feels buffeted by these, uh, by these things and, and wants to know whether they can do something about it and, and what can they do, what would you tell them? Uh, first. I am heartened, I know this sounds uh, very uh, naive, by the number of people that are interested in this year's election. We've gone from years where fewer and fewer people were interested in voting, and uh, that's changed. And maybe because I have a daughter who's going to be voting for the first time, the amount of interest, and that makes me feel very good. I also see where um, public concern, when it's harnessed with an organization that is powerful, can really make a difference. I'll give you one example. Uh, another environmental group, uh, the Natural Resources Defense Council, um, was angry that Toyota was not supporting stronger fuel standards. So they started a blog um, about Toyota having one public view, which is very green, but then privately not supporting the standard. And they unleashed the power of the internet again uh, and their grassroots troops in a very sophisticated combination. And Toyota went from being an opponent of stronger fuels legislation to now one of its proponents. That would not happen unless you had a strong consumer base that just needs to get tapped in the right way. So what, do I believe that there's enough activism out there? No. Do I believe it's our challenge at Consumer Reports to teach consumers to negotiate not just for a better toaster, but for uh, cleaner air and for safer cars and for universal health care? Yes. And that's the challenge that we face uh, moving forward. My thanks to Christopher Meyer, the Vice President of External Affairs at Consumers Union, the publisher of Consumer Reports. I'm Ken Fisher. Thank you for joining us on this edition of Citywide.